Uh, thank you very much. It's very exciting to be opening the first uh, affirmation session here at GSAP. And, uh, and of course, how could it not? Uh, we were planning to have TJ demos, and we have TJ demos. We're incredibly happy. Uh, but also, Olalekan Jayfus, and he's trapped in traffic because of the rain. So, what a better way to sense what the mess, what is the mess we're in, uh, and how much design, planning, preservation it's needed here. Uh, that that living these difficulties and, and experiencing them and kind of challenging the format that we've been so much thinking about. But I ask everyone to be patient. Uh, and Olalekan is coming, right? Uh, and right, uh, so we'll have him eventually at one point. Probably very wet, super wet. And I'm also very happy to have Felicity here. Felicity Scott uh, responding uh, uh, to TJ and, and Lek and, and also the entire GSAP community being part of this. Uh, and uh, this is actually the first uh, event that Barjan uh, is, Polman is uh, curating and I'm, I've been also working with him, but it's, uh, Barjan is the the GSAP director of uh, public events and exhibitions and the curator of the uh, uh, Arthur Rose Gallery, following a, an amazing list of great work for the Arthur Rose Gallery. We have Mark Wasita here that uh, invented what architectural exhibitions are and very much uh, helped GSAP to think what, what we are. Uh, and also Clarice Figueiredo, uh, who's helping here also and uh, working with Barjan and on this. The title of today's session is Anchored Futurism. And futurism, of course, for TJ and, K and Lek means something different to just see, think what is the evolution of the present. Uh, futurism is a site where actually the powers and the structures of the present can be challenged and where actually the, the, those that are different sites can gain a possibility to, to have an agency to decide the, the, the next to come. Uh, but also decide where histories can be uh, uh, redefined and where those that were hidden or marginalized from official and hegemonic histories can be brought back to visibility and allowed uh, to be uh, uh, making the future. And I think this is something that we is deeply connected uh, to what we stand for at a place like GSAP where we project. And those projections are not just continuities of what exists, but rather opportunities to reinvent and reload the past as a project that has to do with justice, with activism, and also a way to challenge the present. I think this is a good starting point, point for the affirmations. And I want to say that affirmation, actually we have Jack Halberstam here that will also be part of affirmations. And affirmation also comes from the whole tradition of trans activism and a way to affirm uh, as, a, as a way to challenge also normativity, patriarchates and binarisms, a way to affirm as a way also to redefine how societies are, and ecosystems are constructed. Affirmation is for us intrinsically connected also to making history, to, to writing theory, to doing uh, uh, design, to basically engaging with all the things that happen in this building. And I want to say how important it is uh, that we have this conversation with many different people. It's not a conversation among peers, I would say, but about people that share engagement, but that are coming from many different grounds. We will have designers, theorists, we'll have people that are doing planning, we will have activists coming, people that are writing from many different perspectives and disciplines, and people that are experimenting with very different approaches to basically what's the making of the reality that we're, we're part of and how it can be challenged, how can we be dissident to it, and how can we project uh, uh, the next to come. Uh, I think this is also a conversation that we need to open to a large uh, community and networks of people uh, that we want to agree and disagree with. And that's why the affirmations in the way that Barjan and myself have been working on this and many others is open to a cohort, a planetary cohort, we call it, uh, of people that have uh, a role, that role to, to be part of this and, and, uh, and send their ideas. And I want to welcome this uh, community and, and cohort of respondents, of affirmation respondents that are now connected and that Clarice is uh, uh, in connection with. Uh, I think this is very important, so we're talking to the future. And we, this is Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. My name is Andres. Andres Haken, I'm the, at this point the dean of this school, and, and I'm happy to be sharing this with all of you. 
um, there's actually a, one thing that I also want to, uh, to underscore is that everyone here probably has been prepared to come here. Uh, we shared the text that you, the chapter two of your, of your book, TJ. We also shared, uh, shared an, a list of links to videos that, that, can, that Blake is produced. And that's crucial for us, so we hopefully can agree and disagree with more detail or more nuance here. And, uh, and with this, I would like to open the session and I would like to welcome also to, to, to give the floor to Barjan, who is going to introduce the speakers and the, the topic that we're doing today. Thank you very much for coming here. All right, welcome everyone to what is the inaugural session of Affirmations. Um, and I want to not only welcome all of you present in the room, um, but also all of us, all of you who join us remotely on GSEP's YouTube channel and in particular the members um, of our planetary cohort um, of respondents who are joining us across many different si time zones. So good night, good morning, good afternoon or good evening to you. Um, and since I know that several actually of you are following us from Khartoum, I also want to mention that in light of the current situation in Sudan, um, we follow it with concern and our thoughts are with you as we hope the situation will improve soon. Um, my name is Bartjan Polman and I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public uh, Programming here at GSEP. And these past few months, um, we worked hard to develop a new format of talks, ones that, ones that open up the programming to a planetary horizontal cohort, and one in which we invite multiple speakers per session around different themes. The intention of the series, which should really be seen in its totality, um, or understood in its totality rather, um, is to develop a platform for discussions that are transdisciplinary, engaged with all aspects of the built environment, and crucially, understand the built environment not through isolated or autonomous objects, but rather as operating at the intersection of multiple networks, ecosystems, and scales. And this would include, I would argue, um, the scale of time. But perhaps more important, and as the title suggests, um, the series is also meant to affirm possibilities. Possibilities for ecosystems, societies, and worlds to come, discussed through the built environment and as mer emerging from the ruins of manifold contemporary crises. Possible futures that emerge from the cracks in the structures of power built on the interdependency of carbonization, extractivism, colonization, racialization, anthropocentrism, inequality, patriarchy, and technocracy. And for that reason, we are particularly excited that Olalekan Jefus um, and TJ Demos um, are joining us here today for our very first affirmation together with Felicity Scott. Because their work in manifold ways um, directly engages with such alternative and possible futures. Now, not to, to be sure of ungrounded visions, but futures rather that are fundamentally rooted in various pasts. Futures not necessarily as distant, but as alternative realities. Futures that in themselves, as TJ mentions, um, often in his book, require the politicization, uh, politicization of time. Lack, in a talk at the African Futures Institute in 2021, has called this Afro-surrealist co-atemporal fictions. Critically unpacking the contradictions in the worlds he represents, these are futures that are also, as he calls them, alternate pasts or retro-futurist retro worlds. TJ Demos, in his most recent book with the eponymous title, discusses various possible futures under the rubric of radical futurisms, fundamentally grounded in the traditions of the oppressed and radically rejecting the privileged access to hegemonic time. These futurisms are discussed through a diversity of practices and the urgent need to articulate new forms of solidarity. These, in other words, are futures that are disruptions. A radicality that Demos, following, following Angela Davis and Marx, calls an ecology of connectedness that is situates across, and I quote, current Afrofuturisms, indigenous and Chicanx futurisms, queer and trans futurisms, crip futurisms, Muslim and Gulf futurisms, and so on. End of quote. It is within these and other futures that we want to situate our discussions in affirmations in the eight months to come. Starting tonight, and we are incredibly excited to have Lek and TJ Demos, Lek soon, uh, TJ Demos already here, share the stage for a very first session. Um, I, reading my notes now, I see we'll start with a presentation by Lek, which is not true. Uh, we'll start uh, with a presentation by um, TJ Demos, uh, but he will be followed um, by Lek, so I'll introduce Lek first. Um, who is joining us from, from Brooklyn, where he is based. Um, trained as an architect with a 
Bjark from Cornell University, um, Lex's work as an artist through numerous representational strategies and through a fundamentally transdisciplinary scope, and this is crucial, um, reimagines alternate worlds and societies at the nexus of the African diaspora, technology, architecture, societies, communities, and ecosystems. He has created multiple large-scale public installations over the past decade, and uh, the latest addition to which will be the recently approved monument for Congresswoman um, Shirley Shisholm, which he designed together with Amanda Williams. His now long list of exhibitions includes work being shown at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Vitor Design Museum, the Guggenheim in Bilbao, Spain, and the Museum of Modern Art, where his work is featured in the permanent collection. Um, the incredible installation ACE AAP about the All African Protoport, which I believe we will discuss today, gained him the Silver Lion at the most recent Venice Architecture Biennial. So Lex's uh, talk will be preceded um, uh, by a talk from, from TJ Demos, who is the Patricia and Roland Ribelli um, Endowed Chair in Art History in the Department of, uh, of the History of Art and Visual Culture at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, he's also the founding director of the um, Center for uh, Creative Ecologies, and Demos has written extensively on the intersection of contemporary art, global politics, and ecology. And his book includes, among others, Against the Anthropocene, Visual Culture and Environment Today, Decolonizing Nature, Contemporary Art and the Politics of Ecology, and Return to the Post-Colony, Specters of Colonialism in Contemporary Art. Demos was chair and chief curator of the Climate Collective at the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology in Lisbon. And his most recent book, as I mentioned, is Radical Futurisms, Ecologies of Collapse, Chronopolitics and Justice to Come, which is now out from Sternberg Press and is the topic of today's conversation. Uh, we are also incredibly happy that Felicity Scott will join us um, to first respond after Lech and TJ's presentations. Um, Felicity is professor of architecture here at GSEP, um, the director of the PhD program in architecture, history and theory, um, and the co-director of the program in critical, curatorial and conceptual practices in architecture. She is the recipient of numerous awards and a founding co-editor of Grey Room. Um, her critical and historical work on countercultures, alternate realities of sorts, um, as well as in tracing the genealogies of political engagement with questions of techno-scientific and environmental transformations across multiple disciplines, which she has done through numerous books, such as um, Architecture Techno-Utopia, work on Ant Farm um, or Outlaw Territories, makes it a perfect interlocutor um, for tonight's effort. And I see Lek uh, is joining here. Hi, welcome. Um, but uh, but that is uh, not all. As we mentioned, uh, we also have a, a planetary, co planetary cohort and in-person audience. Um, and the idea is that after Felicity's uh, response, when, once we move here, um, we will open it up to both the cohort and the audience. And the cohort has submitted questions in advance, of which um, Clarissa and myself, we made, we made a sort of um, selection. Um, and uh, she is also manning what is a sort of affirmation station um, where um, on the webinar people can also ask questions. So, so we'll, we'll post some of those as well. I also want to thank uh, Yui Karma and Elisa uh, Nakamura, who will also be assisting us uh, tonight with uh, facilitating the questions. Um, and with that, I'll give the floor. Are you comfortable starting or? Yeah. Okay. So then, let's 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 stick with the original plan. Yeah. And and then uh, we'll I give the floor to to Lek. Welcome. <laughs> ah. Okay. okay. You need this this mic then. Will it just advance to my presentation? Yes. <laughs> uh. I want to thank you for inviting me to this wonderful panel. I'm very excited about it, and all of you for coming out today. Um, the Protopian Parallel. So I'm going to discuss two projects that have um, almost opposing paradigmatic approaches to my speculative world building aspect of my practice. Um, the first is the frozen neighborhoods, which really imagines uh, a kind of severe authoritarian response to a global climate crisis and how that um, sort of legislation that's enacted by the federal government ends up having this sort of massive uh, regressive impact on marginalized communities as this tends to happen, right? And so um, it takes place in 
a kind of alternative timeline to our own. Uh, the legislation's enacted in 1972, I'm calling it 1X72, and the sort of um, accommodating imagery and installations, sculpture, experimental animation takes place roughly like 1995. So that is one aspect. And I'm looking at sort of the response of one particular community, Brooklyn, New York, to that. The second one is a project that I, and both of these are really ongoing works of my own. I'd like, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that I have such, you know, like I completely build up these worlds and then I have to really like fine tune and distill them down for uh, whatever venue they're showing in. <laughs> so I have to exercise like restraint and be careful and intentional about what I'm trying to articulate. Um, the second one is called the ACEAAP, and that is African Conservation Efforts uh, slash All Africa Protoport. And in this one, uh, it's the exact opposite. I imagine what would happen if around the same time, 1X72 in an alternate timeline, um, it takes place um, on the continents of Africa, but throughout the sort of African world, the diaspora, what would happen if shortly after these countries gained independence on the continents that um, the sort of extractive colonial forces were removed and um, a sort of thriving conservation, global conservation effort took place. Um, so for the first one, which was exhibited at MoMA in 2021 as part of the Reconstructions uh, exhibit, um, we were 11 architects, artists, designers invited to sort of reimagine cities under the guise of sort of reconstruction, um, however that might manifest through our projects. And I knew I wanted to do Brooklyn. I'd been a Brooklyn resident for about 23 years, so I moved there shortly after graduating. And um, I, I, I sort of started with exercises during the height of the pandemic when we're all sort of grounded and when we see the sort of infrastructures um, that we know haven't served us well begin to really crumble during the pandemic. And again, see its effect on sort of marginalized communities. So I just spent a lot of time walking around a neighborhood, taking photographs of like rooftops, alleyways, air gaps between buildings, uh, community gardens, different yards, places where I imagined we could sort of rebuild between a kind of architectural urban infrastructure. So this is a view from my roof here where I thought of also preserving certain things that I'd seen uh, or to me is so much a kind of part of, of, of the fab urban fabric of Brooklyn, particularly the bodegas, uh, storefront churches, uh, subway infrastructure, right? Preserving that. Those are sort of the things that begin to get sanitized and tidied up as these communities get rapidly gentrified. Uh, so this is Bodega Eco Haven. So it really draws on that kind of aesthetic, um, but also really a rewilding of the neighborhood, of the community. And so this is also on the roof of my apartment looking back towards. So there's things I'm thinking through just, these are very much uh, just sort of exercises, almost playful visual exercises. So this is like a rooftop marsh, thinking about, you know, the, the, the lack of shade in certain communities, the lack of public pools. So this is like a freshwater marsh on the roof in the height of summer. And again, I start to introduce these sort of um, inventive but non-specific agrotechs. So this is like an aeroponic, aquaponic rooftop vertical. Uh, produce farm with these sort of both uh, manual and automated drones that could deliver this kind of produce throughout the neighborhood. And this is a sort of like rainwater harvesting, same thing, drone delivery of fresh water throughout the neighborhood, but really building this kind of, um, you know, these, these sort of prosthetic architectural interventions into the, you know, the kind of urban architectural fabric of Brooklyn and then really kind of getting into the narrative more, but in a very much a sort of visual exercise. This is a scrap yard, junkyard, not too far from where I live as well, where I thought then of, you know, which would be a kind of depot for these manual slash uh, 
automated aeroponic, aquaponic produce uh, centers. So these are just different views. And you know, the space between buildings, just really sort of occupying all these kind of different spaces that fall outside of uh, the kind of real estate, uh, you know, construct of, of how, um, you know, housing and stuff is uh, operated and how people are displaced, you know, kind of reclaiming these sort of spaces. So this is like a, 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 a microclimate bubble farm, the idea that uh, flora and plants that are not native to Brooklyn or even the Northeast could be grown in these little microclimate bubbles. And of course, during the pandemic, we weren't riding the trains, we were kind of sitting still, so what would that look like for the MTA? And it moved into these first visual exercises, then transformed into the frozen neighborhoods. So I collaborated with a good friend uh, and colleague of mine, Matty Vaz, who I went to Cornell with, he's a historian. Um, and we sort of set up the premise for, for this world, right? And again, this kind of very authoritative legislation um, called the mobility credit system. And the idea is that individuals, families, however you identify in your tax form, determines how far, how often, how frequently you can travel, what type of travel. But we placed it at the kind of, um, you know, sort of fell under the free market trade. So you were a lot of these mobility credits, but you could sell them, you could trade them, you could do what you would, <clears throat> excuse me, with them. And so the idea is that the rich bought up a lot of the mobi mobility credits, you know, wanting to maintain their sort of free flowing, uh, <laughs> traveling the globe, peripatetic, you know, peripatetic lifestyle, discursive lifestyle travel. So again, this is actually a friend and colleague's office building here, but I started looking at these scenes throughout Brooklyn to build up and reimagine in this world. Um, and so the idea is that a lot of the neighborhoods on the perimeter are kind of in this flood zone. So I'm creating, you know, um, building again, drawing on a lot of the assets that I develop, a lot of the sort of library of tech and greenery creating what this world looks like from 1x72 to 1x95, where a lot of these photo montages take place. And so for the installation in MoMA, as I mentioned, I have this massive world in my mind, but now I have a small slice of real estate <laughs> to put it together and to then present it to an audience. What am I thinking when I, ha when I just see a million different stories, vignettes, what have you? So it, for me, it's broken down into, um, you know, I have a series of these photo montages. I have three channel experimental animation that's sort of fly through of this world. Um, these kind of um, sculptures, architectural maquettes, what have you and then um, a large scale or full scale sort of subway map, which is uh, uh, one of the commercial and slash residential mailboxes that you see all throughout the neighborhood in Brooklyn. So the idea is that these things are retrofit commandeered to create the new Brooklyn uh, MTA map. And so there's a seasonal occupancy map that you know points to all the different neighborhoods where uh, they're flood zones throughout the year, so people have to migrate to the center and what have you. Um, in keeping with that aesthetic and that language of the bodega, um, you know, much of my practice is defined by my architectural education, my undergrad architectural education, and the idea that um, whatever my sort of narrative is, I kind of remain consistent within um, the sort of parameters that I've set for myself. So I took a picture of a bodega, which is just up two blocks away from me, and replaced all of their advertising and their signage and the language with information about my installation, about the kind of uh, advanced green technologies, um, about the system like the Interfaith uh, Seed Bank, which I imagine that the Hasidic and Muslim and Presbyterian storefront church communities have now organized to um, facilitate the sort of storing and the sharing and the distribution of seeds and what have you. So this sort of community response to, again, these very regressive policies taking place not in a kind of um, 
a future, right? But really imagining this alternate timeline from the past that could have occurred given a set of these particular conditions. Um, and so here is what I'm calling the uh, East New York substation TFN clerisy code room. So again, I've imagined that uh, you know, the, the, the youth of this community who have a kind of uh, aptitude for technology and coding are the ones who are creating um, all of the necessary software programming technology that drives um, everything in the community from you know, the automated seed banks, uh, aquaponic farms and what have you, um, freshwater systems, uh, the sort of hacking of the MTA. And this is what the MTA looks like in this world now. So it's transformed from the Metropolitan Transit Transportation Authority to the main threshold access. So it's now a space for like social services, uh, church services, global networks, communication, virtual travel, gaming, what have you. Um, and it's all sort of 24 hour service. And so this 24-hour gateway kiosk you see on the left here is you'd have all of these hacked, retrofit commercial mailboxes sprinkled throughout the neighborhood where you'll be made aware of what trains or what area are providing services where. And so also these kind of playful little sculptures. So this is the Agri-Guild Dispersal Samsara. So it's kind of like the idea of the dandelion, you, you can program this to go land on a roof somewhere with an entire like profile of bioforestry plantings of what you may want to grow and it will unfold like a petal and you, won't have, like, you don't have to do anything. So the idea that they responded with all of this incredible sort of proprietary technology, um, somewhere between a sort of dystopian conditions create not necessarily a utopian world but protopian idea that I'm presenting the possibilities, but also the inherent tensions. People can't leave these communities. So it's a sense, uh, you know, drawing on the idea of the maroon communities, you know, where you're thriving in a sense, but under harsh conditions. And so there's a series of these uh, montages, incredibly detailed. Uh, the interfaith plant seeds grow, grow blessings. Sorry, grow blessings is um, again the sort of uh, endeavor formed by the coming together of the Hasidic Muslim communities and, and Presbyterian Seventh Day Adventist religious communities to sort of run the seed bank system. Um, the Crown Pro wetland intersection is again the flooding, and a lot of the main arteries in Brooklyn. Um, are now given over to these sort of freshwater spaces where baptism or, baptisms are occurring or just, you know, people enjoying swimming. Um, and then once again, the East New York Gateway um, and the Franklin Avenue shuttle. And these are all started from photographs I've taken just throughout my neighborhood are the basis for each of these that I then build up with this imagery. So I'll let this run very shortly.
Christ. <laughs> so um, for the Venice Biennale, which is, um, I think it ends November 15th or so, uh, the African conservation efforts and the All Africa Protoport. So if um, the frozen neighborhoods was about being isolated um, and being kind of cut off and what, you know, this, this community is able to sort of create under those circumstances. The African conservation effort in the All Africa Protoport is almost the exact opposite, taking place where um, the first elaborate fiction kind of begins in this 1x72 alternate timeline. And the idea being that, um, again, you know, when I think of sort of science fiction as we understand it in sort of the Western context, it, it, it sort of assumes this thing that we don't really look at, right? You don't really get to Star Trek. If we're assuming that it's coming out of this timeline that we're in, right, although it's their own alternate timeline, you don't really get to Star Trek without uh, colonialism, imperialism, slave labor, <laughs> right? The ships don't get powered without that kind of extractive technology. So for me, it's interesting to think of um, pivoting from, again, roughly the 60s when so many African countries gained independence. Um, and what if things like the sort of the underdevelopment, the resource curse, curses, um, all of the sort of oil rich, uh, new, you know, natural resources rich countries, um, what would happen if, if instead of that path, the path that we're on right now, um, there was a kind of organized effort throughout the continent to look at sort of alternate systems um, that drew on, you know, a blend of both current and long-standing traditional uh, knowledge systems of looking to create different forms of energy, fuel, and what have you. So I imagine this world, and also I'm coming out of, out of um, you know, even like it's almost a nostalgic uh, project in a sense for me as well because I was born in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. My father is Yoruba. My mom is black American from DC. And so I left Nigeria when I was six years old, but I traveled extensively, transatlantic travel throughout my childhood. Um, back then you could put little kids on a plane <laughs> by themselves. <laughs> so I was like four, my brother is seven. We get put on the plane in Lagos. We'd land in JFK, my uncle would pick us up and then either we'd stay at night or he'd put us on a plane to um, Reagan, I don't know if it was called Reagan back then, Reagan National or Dulles. Uh, we did that a bunch of times. And so I remember that era very vividly as kind of, in a sense, the end of the golden age of travel. So a lot of airlines that, that we were flying at that time, Pan Am, British Caledonian, KLM, they no longer exist, but that memory of being in these spaces and, and Heathrow and um, you know, JFK and such at that time, drawing on that visual aesthetic as well. So it's not like I'm reaching all the way back. I'm starting in the 70s when there already is an enormous amount of Western influence already, even in the architecture and the sort of styling, the clothing. The idea that, you know, the sort of modernist, brutalist architecture figured heavily in like nation building and identity for a lot of African countries. So working with that aesthetic, but imagining if there was this massive effort throughout the diaspora um, connecting, you know, kind of picking up the idea of sort of pan-Africanism. Um, and I imagine that, you know, the sort of piece the resistance of the, of the African conservation effort becomes this all Africa protoport, which um, are these sort of really massive zero emissions travel complexes, but slash also research centers, cultural centers, what have you. And so the project kind of looks through series of these proprietary technologies, 
Uh, it's all algae powered, the discovery of algae, and uh, you know, discovery of using algae for power, um, and creating things like the sort of maglev uh, monorail system for like rapid overland travel, and then the algal drift pool and suborbital sort of launch track. So a rocketless propulsion, almost like a rail gun launch system. So I just did these very detailed systems diagrams, technological diagrams, explaining this technology, but really using the aesthetic of that era of like Jet Magazine, of Ebony Magazine, of Air Afrique, that sort of look and feel of um, presenting not only the technology, but the kind of employment, the roles within that particular system. Um, so, you know, kind of working out the sort of rough technology of this suborbital flight system and the characters involved from the launch coordinator to the straddle guide, the one who sort of coordinates um, returning through Earth's atmosphere, landing, what have you, and then wetland marine research. And so, you know, really building up the narrative. Again, this world in my mind is so massive, but I have to like <laughs> drill it down, right? What am I trying to show? What am I trying to talk about? And so it culminates in the newest All Africa proto port that takes place that is established in the Barazzi floodplain, Western Zambia. Specifically there because it's a floodplain, um, so it's great opportunity for both kind of um, this, this sort of hybrid system of wind, algal, sun, solar technology coming together, but also kind of deeply connected sort of cultural history with the Lozi people, right? So that's sort of where I'm kind of introducing, introducing the sort of tensions of this world. Um, and I touch on it briefly in, in, in the narrative, but the idea of is this sort of massive expansionist, um, you know, all Africa protoport, is, is it at the expense of specific cultures and customs and what have you, you know? So, hence the sort of pro prototopian label, the idea that um, it's still sticky and messy, right? And, and there's still, you know, conflict within these systems. Um, so a series of these sort of travel vignettes. So this is the loading dock that brings both different flight operators and, and uh, passengers through to like the suborbital departure lounge. Um, and the idea is that this Barazzi floodplain All Africa protoport is the last, is the latest of 12 protoports. So there's, I can't remember all the name now, but uh, Havana, Dar es Salaam, uh, Mombasa, like sort of major port cities throughout the world, Los Angeles, New York, Barranquilla, Havana, and what have you, major port cities throughout the diaspora. And the latest is not in a port city, it's within the sort of Again, the sort of floodplain, right? Um, but this would be like Los Angeles, and so you have a family. This is sort of like my most nostalgic one, because when we weren't traveling alone, we were traveling with my mother um, and my older brother. So again, you know, this almost sort of like triumphant, like global nationalist sort of imagery of all of the uh, flags of the diaspora, but then, um, sort of ref refined through the colorway of the ACE, right? So there's that tension um, of a sort of African expansionist agenda versus uh, kind of recognition of localized cultures and customs. And so in figuring out how to present that um, in the Venice Biennale, I, you know, I try and control everything I can possibly control. <laughs> so. I, you know, built a model of the space, designed everything, laid everything out, because I don't like having any surprises. I want it to look exactly as I imagine it. Um, designed the furniture, interestingly enough, the furniture is oversized intentionally because I was traveling when I was six years old. So I wanted every adult to have to scoot to the back and dangle their legs off of the seat and be a little child in this departure lounge. So it's a sort of abstracted departure lounge that would be in this Barazzi uh, All Africa protoport. So this is the rendering, and then this is the space. So it's like 
as close as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking of things like the renovation of, of uh, you know, the TWA lounge and JFK and the idea that this is new technology, so there'd be like little models and vitrines of the older protoport systems throughout this. Um, you know, throughout this departure lounge space. So you're kind of roughly in this, in this world, in this sort of really immersive tableau um, with a 20 foot tall LED video wall that was um, a blend of a sort of video essay, um, but also like a terminal departure window. So you'd be looking out onto, you know, when you're at, when you're in a departure lounge, you're looking out onto the tarmac, the apron, the baggage handlers, and all of that. Uh, so really kind of recreating that feeling, presenting the, mo presenting the montages as they would be in, you know, sort of airport public art. And again, um, yeah, the sort of technical illustration systems diagrams, this massive kind of psychogeographic map that explains the suborbital technology and all of the um, different protoports and the travel times between them. Um, and then a series of these like really early studies, again, in that sort of aesthetic of like Jet Magazine, Air Afrique, um, looking at the employees of the All Africa protoport. So everything from the baggage handlers to the flight attendants to the um, pilots to the groundskeepers and what have you. Um, and again, these sort of early models of like the monorail conductors, the sort of marine technologists, little yellow submarine. Um, and then this is kind of what it, what it looks like with folks sort of occupying the space there. And I don't know how we're doing on time. The video, I'll just let a little bit of it play. A minute, two minutes. So like the split, so it's like a sort of vintage split flat map of departure times, cycling through, you know, different advertisements, um, this kind of video essay that explains a little bit about the world of this. In the wake of the Pan-African movement and the great wave of independence, imperialist infrastructures devoted to economic exploitation, resource extraction, and environmental degradation were rapidly dismantled. This initiated a seismic shift in the continent's political trajectory that brought about the end of colonialism and the rapid dismantling of imperialist infrastructures. As a result, local environmental groups consolidated into what became known as the African Conservation Effort. By applying indigenous knowledge to repair the damage caused by former colonial powers, AC implemented an intense pursuit of alternate energy sources. 
The newly formed organization would meet the challenge of this pursuit in the discovery of the almost limitless potential of algae. A sea scientist created genetically modified algae that minimized non-productive electric charge dissipation during photosynthesis. They struck veritable gold and the practical application of this discovery would be far and wide-reaching. Through cooperative work with scientists and innovators across the diaspora, SE expanded its knowledge base, bringing about a new era of collaboration. Their breakthroughs had far-reaching implications for energy production and distribution, environmental conservation, engineering, material science, and transportation logistics. Suborbital flight was a key advancement in transportation and logistics among the various forms of hyper-travel. These advancements were leveraged to strengthen relationship between the diaspora by proposing the development of massive research and travel complexes to be located off the coast of 12 host cities. They became known as All Africa Protoports and they were considered freely associated sovereign domains. All Africa Protoports are now a network of large sustainable research and travel com. All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Um, thanks to Andres and um, uh, Bart for the invitation. Um, and it's, it's an honor to present uh, and share my work with you around my recent uh, book project called Radical Futurisms. I think there'll be lots of resonance with, with Lex's uh, presentation and uh, his work. So, um, I'll just jump right into this. Um, and uh, I'm going to present some material from the book, uh, drawn from different sections, uh, as you'll see. And I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Uh, with his compelling contribution to indigenous futurism, the trans and queer artist uh, T.J. Cuthand's reclamation from 2018 documents what's to come. And I'm going to show some clips from this work. And whenever possible, I, I've identified the, um, the URL where you can um, actually go in and see it. Um, mo most of the work is open access. Premised upon a mass settler exodus to Mars in the near future, the short video portrays a broken, abandoned Earth left to indigenous, in indigenous peoples who, freed of extractive devastation, toxic racism, repressive heteronormativity, and the endless wars and violence of capitalist property relations subsequently begin the work of post-colonial environmental restoration. Delivered through uh, familiar documentary tropes, the piece showcases interviewees, like you see here, discussing their newfound lives with contextualized footage of uh, dystopian landscapes presented in the evidentiary mode with a handheld camera's reality effects. Its futurism unleashes radical formal possibilities in decolonizing time, that is, reversing conventional documentaries' ties to pastness, projecting the that which has been into the what's to come. And it generates forces of creation beyond the mimetic doubling of reified and colonial realities. It thereby lays an explosive charge in the present through performative imagination, rendering the future as disruption that much more probable. I was scared that they had done so much to this planet that there'd be no way for us to fix it. <laughs> It's a lot cleaner. Yeah, it it's is. It's a lot cleaner. Like, it smells good here. In it smells like smells nature. Great. It smells like we're making a difference here. We've cleaned a lot of this area up. 
This is what we do. We clean up things. We make sure the area is safe for barefoot walking, pretty much. Uh, and this is just one of our bins. We have, we filled up approximately 500,000 bins. This white people left. Full-time job is cleaning up after these pukes. We see some garbage, we pick it up. That's what everybody does around here. Here, documentary figures is the creative practice of what I term chronopolitics, designating the politics of time as much as the time of politics, both implying there's nothing natural or inevitable about how we organize temporality or when we engage in politics. As such, documentary provides a technology for revealing portals into futures alternative to the now recalling Arundhati Roy's description of the recent pandemic conjuncture, where structural breakdown discloses newfound opportunities for a creative transformation of what's yet to be. Passing through that portal, we can cast a barrier of eternity between the barbarism of the present and the justice of the hereafter. The stakes are indeed enormous. We're caught in a situation in which time has been colonized, racialized and economized, generating what uh, black quantum futurism, the Afrofuturist collected based in Philadelphia, term the temporal ghettos of racial capitalism, where the master's clockwork universe unevenly distributes spatio-temporal mobility, agency, and determination. Just as material inequality reigns, we succumb to the endless present of capital's calculative machinery, seemingly rendering resistance pointless. Time operationalized as such recalls what Jasper Puar terms prehensive futurity, a chronology that inevitabilizes a desired unfolding. Um, as she writes, we cannot get out of the present because we're tethered to the desired future. Past, present, and future feel somewhat futile as descriptions of temporal distinctions. Conventional documentary tends to reify that time trap. Cuthand's reclamation, a decolonization of time as much as of space, poignantly contests dominant, dominant approaches to time, including techno-libertarians' uh, prehensive futurity and its colonization of land, the economy, and the infosphere of communications as much as of temporality. It's as if its vision of what's to come is a foregone conclusion, as when uh, the billionaire tech entrepreneur Elon Musk, in response to charges of complicity in the 2019 anti-democratic political takeover in Bolivia, in part to secure lithium reserves for global markets, including for his own Tesla cars and SpaceX project, later tweeted, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. Performing the hegemonic futurity to which we're all tethered, Musk pushes extractive colonial capitalism into any and all territories, including outer space, as well as into infinity. And thankfully in 2020, Evo Morales' Moss Party reversed that lithium coup on the frontiers of green capitalism. That new green coloniality entails destroying the lands, waters, and life chances of frontline communities worldwide, producing a, a growing class of the indebted, uh, the vulnerable and disenfranchised, subjected to all manner of police violence, incarceration, and growing deaths of despair, on top of mounting climate disasters, existential insecurity, and pandemic emergency. Given the resulting desperation, our forlorn present has triggered blunt expressions of time resistance. Like Alicia Wormsley's, there are black people in the future. Placed in halting all white, uh, all cap white letters on a black billboard in Detroit, as well as on various artistic objects and sculptural pieces, installations, and in films. Wormsley's revolt against being defutured elaborated in a proleptic tense of the present impending, a chronopolitics of prefiguration, resonates with the ongoing battles over public monuments and their removals. These highlight the otherwise suppressed violence of colonialism and slavery and their contested aftermath, 
past and present conflicts over heritage inextricable from the very social production of the future, which also indexes the stakes of documentary today. Who has the right to produce the future? Radical futurisms, the subject of my recent book, have arisen in recent years to assert this right, articulated through speculative visions of times to come, as witnessed internationally in the formation of creative practices pledged to decolonize uh, the not yet. These rescue open potentiality from the grips of capitalism's algorithmic capture, its technogenic determinations, and its biosecurities of control. Building on the precedence of Afrofuturisms of decades past, when black sci-fi and musical experimentation projected an emancipated technological presence in years ahead, as fictionally dramatized and historicized in Black Audio Film Collective's film, The Last Angel of History of 1996, these practices now generate new configurations of documentary and aesthetic practice more broadly in multiple sectors, including those of indigenous futurisms, trans and queer futurisms, and multi-species and socialist futurisms, and more. Radical futurisms remake time. They derail temporal trajectories from present tracks, casting the what's to come into the undetermined not yet. As modalities of chronopolitics, they de-essentialize and de-normalize time, operationalizing its becomingness anew in the formation of other worlds, reanimating suppressed pasts as much as inventing potential futures. Opposing the sequestering of the political within narrow confines, such as electoral seasons or parliamentary debates, radical futurisms resituate and expand time's operation as contestable, reinventable, and multiply structured, Futurism's radical character is structurally analytical rather than liberal reformist and anti-systemic or anti-capitalist. Its interventions transformative and generative. Radical futurisms cast the future as disruption, as Frederick Jameson termed it in his words, as a radical and systemic break with even that predicted and colonized future, which is simply a prolongation of our capitalist present. Or in another approach, radical simply means grasping things at their roots, as Angela Davis has observed, echoing Marx, reaching not only a structural depth of analysis, but an ecology of connectedness to past and present struggles, to the links between them, and to the land itself, to the earth and its rhizomatic web of life. Again, Cuthand's video and its embedding of futurity uh, in decolonized land back is exemplary, reaching down into the emancipated muddy soil, which is newly gardened, and up into the liberated atmosphere, free of aircraft, and affecting everything in between. Radical futurisms crystallize in and through localized practices and ambitiously scale up transnational formations, increasingly the challenge today, in order to oppose global capitalist hegemony and replace it with something else. Radical futurisms posit the future as disruption, as structurally opposed to the enforced capitalist temporality of corporate globality, its anti-political technocracy, its market fundamentalism, its predictive algorithmic recommendations, its technogenic accelerations, its politics reduced to policing, its luxury commodity production, its colonial extractivism. In another formulation, anti-systemic radical futurisms resolve colonial and racial capitalism into decolonial anti-racist eco-socialism or even degrowth communism. Futurisms are radical because they grow out of the tradition of the oppressed, to invoke the resonant phrase of Walter Benjamin, articulated in another historical moment of anti-fascist emergency. Indeed, it can only be so. It's there and only there that we learn that the emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. 
There that we must thread together the many apocalypses, past, present, and future, understanding them as related and mutually informing, if differentiated, but not as accidental, new, or discrete. It's there that the future becomes radical and anti-oppressive struggles responding to past and present violence and their associated traumas guide the coming liberation, even while it acknowledges the unrepairable and the unforgettable, the unassimilable. Not all violence can be healed. If we're not afraid to adopt a revolutionary stance, if indeed we wish to be radical in our quest for change, Angela Davis reminds us, then we must get to the roots of our oppression. Black quantum futurism's chronopolitics materialize video assemblages and photomontages that unleash the force of radical reversibility. They target time zones that keep racialized bodies locked in oppressive cells, fortified by all manner of temporal encasements, racialized projections of unchanging pasts, presences of indolence and criminality, defutured voids. From these, they break out as with their 2019 video uh, Black Space Agency training video, overlapping, where overlapping images blur into illegibility and shapes mirror and mutate, mimicking soundscapes filled with echoes and reverberations, all emanating from a deep psychic space of traumatic collective memory in the afterlife of slavery and in the recent past of housing segregation. Uh, and this is a short clip. Foregrounded in the experimental music of BQF member uh, Kame Ayewa, also known as uh, More Mother, sonic elements perform like their visual analogs as so many renegade elements, oftentimes ripped from appropriated sources of violence. Some are sourced from deadly encounters with anti-black police brutality, as with the sound piece The Afterlife of Events, Time Distortion, from 2016 with its torturous audio mixed with brutalist electronica representing Sandra Bland's violent arrest by police in Texas before her suspicious death or murder in jail. Um, they write, Black Quantum Futurism, we believe that astrological events are reversed and act retrocausally from the cosmic future to influence present events that will be subsequently written on the fabric of the past by light and sound. Such is a recipe for futurism's transformative power in the present. With Black Spa Space Agency and associated collages, BQF graphs the techno-optimism of past space travel, dramatized in astronaut iconography and mirrored helmets reflecting black faces, onto newspaper clips reporting unfulfilled urban housing justice dreams, resonating with the goals of BQF's Community Futures Lab, uh, in North Philadelphia, where another member, Rashida Phillip Phillips, works as a housing rights lawyer. Their cultivation of space agency is then juridical, political, and geographical, as much as aesthetic and temporal. Indeed, the challenge is how to constellate their pulsating lights and sounds to gain the future they want, <clears throat> ripped from the contradictions of racialized inequalities and resource allocation as their video quotes Martin Luther King Jr. perhaps more valid today than in 1966, where he said, there is a striking absurdity in committing billions to reach the moon where no people live, when while the densely populated slums are allocated minuscule appropriations, um, or the work of Gil Scott Heron also comes to mind. Those uneven geographies are also upended in Cuthan's reclamation, resonating with the, world res uh, the resounding world historical project of decolonization, as demanded by indigenous formations like uh, Idle No More, and more recently, the Red Nation. For them, decolonization represents the abolition of dominant economic arrangements and socio-political systems organized around extraction and exploitation, 
bringing to an end more than 500 years of colonial history and making way for future collective emancipation. The video's performative power constructs its subjective viewership as such, as an emancipated people to come on land evacuated of oppressors, which bears on how solidarity might operate today, particularly in settler colonial territories like North America, including in documentary practice. In, a now, uh, in their now classic essay, uh, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang have argued that non-native solidarity with indigenous emancipation must avoid what they term settler moves to innocence or goodwill ally gestures that practice the metaphorization of decolonization uh, by denying its essential meaning, the return of land and sovereignty to indigenous peoples. Without anchoring superficial gestures in that latter's radical meaning, metaphorizing acts which facilely extend decolonization to this or that, whether decolonizing the university or decolonizing sexuality, as necessary as those also are, they problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue settler futurity. Ultimately, for Tuck and Yang, settler accomplices can only accept an ethic of incommensurability when it comes to solidarity, relinquishing, they say, settler futurity, abandoning the hope that settlers may one day be commensurable to native peoples, which in turn requires an understanding of uncommonality that uncoalesces coalition politics. Accepting uncommonality leaves us recourse to alternatives like those presented in radical black praxis, dedicated to the undercommons and a permanent fugitivity, as elaborated by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney where the ref refusal of property and possession of land as much as conventional subjectivities is the ethical truth of emancipated social experience and the only possible horizon for decolonial solidarity. That's exactly what Cut Hand's radical futurism offers to non-indigenous viewers like myself via documentary form a subjective non-place, dispossession and permanent fugitivity. And this precisely because the decolonized what's to come is devoid of settler colonialism's oppressive subjects. With the video, non-indigenous viewers experience their own disappearance. They become accomplices in the abolishing of whiteness as a structure of racial division and colonial oppression. That said, one might argue additionally or conversely, and that's what I try to develop in the book, that demetaphorizing de uh, decolonization shouldn't end in the uncoalescing of coalition politics, but rather reveal new forms of solidarity on that basis. Indeed, there's an urgent need for such alliances now more than ever, given present hyper-partisanship, social media atomization, and ethno-nationalist reaction, in order to build collective power to disrupt the constancy of colonial capitalist violence that harms us all, if differentially, socially, politically, and economically. Writing from yet another radical indigenous perspective, uh, Nick Estes of the Red Nation argues that indigenous futurity is and must be universal. It isn't just for indigenous people, it's essential for the very existence of life on the planet. What's required is a social revolution that turns back the forces of destruction, um, uniting indigenous and non-indigenous people in common struggle against capitalism and colonialism. And in the book, I'm, I'm drawing on um, some of the work of Max Tomba, including this recent book, Insurgent Universality, uh, where he discusses some of the theoretical uh, possibilities of, of this notion of an insurgent universality, which is very different from prior problematic Euro-American forms of um, paradoxical uh, universalisms. Um, so in, uh, in, instead of uh, uncoalescing alliances of difference, another option is unifying in support of identities abolition, at least in its current constructions, which documentary might also abet. At this speculative limit is uh, infinity minus infinity. The Autolith Group's 2019 film linking racial capitalism with the colonial genocide 
perpetrated during the Anthropocene's beginnings in the 16th century conquest of the Americas. Um, and let me play a brief clip of, uh, of their film. The invasion of Europeans in the Americas resulted in a massive genocide of the indigenous population, leading to a decline from 54 million people to approximately 6 million. This led to a massive reduction in farming and the regeneration of forests and carbon uptake, leading to an observed decline in Antarctic ice cores of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, their very expansive history builds further to the hostile environment more recently of British immigration policy, especially that affecting the Windrush generation of migrants living both in the afterlife of slavery, um, to invoke Sadia Hartman's term, and in the post-colonial wake of empire. Uh, the, the Windrush generation referring to Caribbean islanders arriving in the United Kingdom between 1948 and 1971 only to have their residency status questioned and even their citizenship rejected uh, decades later by British xenophobic migration policies. This has been a huge scandal in Britain in the last 10 years. The film's cinematic allegory traces uh, these complex historical networks as mediated by performance and dance, recital, and historical truth-telling by figures who appear as trans-temporal deities. With them, the video choreographs what the artists call a choreopoetics, approximating an aesthetic form of collective speech inspired by the black arts movement poet and playwright Entozaki Shange. The script drawn from diverse sources, including the writings of Jamaican poet Una Marson, uh, Martinican philosopher and poet Edouard Glissant, uh, the Brazilian sociologist uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, and British geographer Catherine Youssef. One central character appears many-headed, as if an Indo-futurist trope signaling multiple realities, a future of many futures in a time-splitting act of metaphysical and even cosmopolitical import. With Ferreira da Silva, the artists speculate about a blackness beyond capture, an infinity beyond infinity, in the place of the subjectivity long denied those of the African dis diaspora by European Enlightenment modernity. Documentary is consequently keyed to the future indeterminate, to the ultimately uncapturable zone of the decolonized fugitive. Ferreira da Silva discusses blackness as antimatter, as negative life, that is, life that has negative value and is instrumentalized historically by Europe's universal measure in defining whiteness as its counterpoint and the height of self-actualizing reason. That reason has been fortified by racial oppositions gained through colonization and enslavement with all of the sociological economic, and representational violences that were cause and consequence of that inequality, including a long history of documentary anthropology. From its negative use value to white reason and the dialectics of race, uh, blackness in Ferreira da Silva's deconstruction opens onto indeterminacy, topologically connected to the infinite and uncontainable, which is approximated in infinity minus infinity uh, by turning the ears, eyes, and fingernails of figures into corporeal portals to other worlds. This is accomplished through a kind of biopolitical montage in which bodily orifices and surfaces provide screens of layered videos within videos revealing ever new scenes from the racial capitalist scene. Um, that is, the geological epoch shaped by colonial capital, offering a more precise descriptor than the Anthropocene. When you slice into me, examining my parts for auguries of the future, you will find traces of compacted carbon compressed within the cells of the whole.
So defining a documentary of allegorical immensity, the, the film's voiceover culminates by speculating about an eventual future resolve of liberation to be achieved only when those myths have been incorporated one into another and recognized as constituent parts of the before and afterlife of slavery and the never-ending colonial project. Reverberating with Cuthand's reclamation, as well as BQF's layered chronopolitics, the Audelith Group's video's performative documentary proposes something like an abolitionist double negative, both catalyzing one, a disidentification, not only from white supremacy, but from the very logic of racial difference. And two, compelling the nullification of the very systems, the legal and economic institutions, the techno-social and educational infrastructure, the effective and aesthetic practices that have re reproduced it historically and into the present. It's only appropriate then uh, that the Autolith Group, in seeking to grant aesthetic form to this complex movement of a deeply historical futurism, find recourse in the imagery of uh, two black holes colliding, creatively adopting a recent computer simulation from the California Institute of Technology that shows that awesome astronomical event detected for the first time ever by the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Roughly 30, ti 30 times the mass of the sun, each of these black holes constitutes a gravitational singularity, wherein space-time curves infinitely. The film operates then, I argue, I suggest in the book, uh, in the space-time between those two black holes, after a past of unforgivable debt in the afterlife of slavery and facing a future filled with indeterminacy beyond reified difference. Its many portals reveal a not yet of radical disruption from a history that must be obliterated but never forgotten. At its best, speculative aesthetics unleashes cosmopolitical force and provides the building blocks, the forms, events, affects, and poetics of new worlds. The challenge remains to organize the social movements to bring them into actuality. Um, that's, that's it, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm actually not so much going to offer a response as I am a set of questions or maybe sort of prompts to hopefully get the two of you talking to each other. Yeah, this is sort of my game plan here and, um, uh, and without, you know, sort of collapsing your projects, maybe to try to find some intersections to get to get you in some type of uh, dialogue. But first I wanted to thank you uh, both for the presentations but also for your larger bodies of work, which I think are you know, important on so many fronts, um, as sort of evident from material you did present today. And I wanted to, to um, let's say, um, maybe I am going to, without collapsing hopefully, but speak to the ways in which in different, in different senses the your projects or your presentations at least traced out sort of improbable, and I want to come back to the Im improbable and what role that plays in refusing something like an instrumental logic. We'll, we'll come back to this. The, the ways in which you're, the, what you presented trace out improbable of sort of ambivalent futures. And I also want to speak to the ambivalence and the politics of that ambivalence. Um, and the ways in which you use, you use these figures to both mark out the contours in the present of violent colonial and anti-black histories and, and also sort of seek in different ways to, to shatter the, the techniques or the techniques of power uh, that those you know, histories of body and perpetuate into the present. Yeah? So this, this act of recovery or return or reprise or refunctioning that, that operates in different ways. And, and so there's an emancipatory sort of imagination, you know, both in Lake's work um, and in the practices that TJ draws upon as a writer uh, to think with and in solidarity with, and, and we can come back to these figures of solidarity, which is so key to, to the book and its framing. Um, and there's also a profound haunting by those histories um, uh, and by the violence of the present that sort of courses through 
the work that you presented. And, and, and I want to sort of try to, to, um, to think about how your work, you know, on the one hand, both of the projects, I think, refuses a too simple telos, yeah, precisely the telos of progress, the, the narrative of technology leading necessarily to a better world, all of those, those legacies of um, Western Enlightenment models that, um, that facilitated so much of the colonial machinery. So I wanted to, to, to think, uh, sort of come back to this, but um, yeah, I wanted to, to think with how you um, manage to keep those ambivalences alive. And sometimes that looks like uh, a sort of dystopian element or, or, or in, in, in TJ's case, you sort of you know, actively insist on the, on the uh, acknowledgement and channeling, um, um, yet refusing amnesia in favor of channeling those violences into the present which is not to say allowing them, yeah, like, I mean, in order to refuse them, but I want to come back to this. So, actually, I'm going to, I'm a bit all over the place. I've got my notes, and then I've got all these side notes from your presentation, so I'm going to make some detours here. Um, but one of, you know, to come back to this, this figure of Atilas, you know, I, I was struck when I read uh, the chapter that, that you shared with us, um, the figure of, of the not yet, yeah, of the not yet future. So in the, in the sort of, in the, f in the future that, that um, is offering um, a figure of not yet, it's a distinct not yet, not yet, obviously from the late colonial not yet, that, that with a sort of endless deferral of something like, you know, um, full sovereignty or, yeah, self-actualization. And, 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 and it struck me that, um, that in your, um, in your use of the figure of not yet, I mean, I, I, I started to wonder whether this was a ironic um, continuity of a, of a figure like not yet, or if it, I mean, like how the not yet figured in relationship to the refusal of telos. I mean, these are, do you know where I'm going here? Um, I mean, the not yet is a dismantling of, of the, the sort of, what you're calling a sort of prefiguration or of the inevitability of the narrative of the future that's built into the colonial and neo-colonial machinery. Yeah, so it's a, a way of resisting something like a too easy realization um, of the present. And yet it does that by appropriating another colonial tool, yeah, a, a colonial temper. Yeah, and, I, I, and I'm trying to get a sense of um, um, how these tensions are, are, are taking risks, yeah, or taking knowing risks, or yeah, taking risks that that understand that there's there's um, yeah, no sort of simple resolution into a new temporal framework. And uh, actually, I'm, I know I'm getting a little lost here, but um, but so if we have on the one hand, Lex retrofuturist world building, and on the other, I said you know TJ's interest in refusing amnesia. And, Marking out this uh, chronopolitics of a of a yet to be that's also a not yet. Yeah, I guess that's the sort of tension I'm trying to um, draw out. That I'm what I want you to maybe both speak about first is is um, the role of sort of residual residual dystopias within the futurities that you're that you're gesturing towards. Yeah, something like the inescapability of um, yeah both of traces of of anti-black and you know colonial violence and and, and 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 I think you know like to come back to the the end of the, the we didn't quite see the end of the video but this is incredible moment where where you know you um, um, you know point out that that imminent within any telos of modernization whether born of African technologies and algae or yeah the Western imaginary is something like a, a Neo-colonial imperative, yeah, that forms of life will be lost and dismantled in the the modernity scripted by, um, uh, yeah, African nations in the 1970s. Yeah, so there's there's always this type of um, temporal topology that's complicated that not only reflects back on on histories, whether they be of the 70s of the present as it marks the future, but but um, but do so without any clean resolution. Yeah, and I'm just trying to. See if you can talk about the sort of, if 
ethical political um, work that that yeah that these recoveries not only of of something like a um, you know utopian future yeah a, a liberated future a properly decolonized future but but a future that remains in 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 a struggle with that um, that machine. Does that make sense? So maybe, and actually, I'm going to ask a slightly different question that will maybe, which is where I was going with all of this, which would be something like, um, um, uh, can we see the different temporal topologies that you're marking out in the work, um, which have intersections and similarities, but also differences? Can we see them um, as as parallel or as antithetical? Are they shared or are they distinct? Are they, I mean, they're obviously doing different types of work, but they seem to be um, um, uh, yeah, sharing concerns, I guess, for want of a better formulation. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, the dystopia question, the, the, the complicated temporal logics that refuse a too easy telos, which is a you know, telos of progress, of, um, uh, of, a, of a Western epistemic framework, but, but at the same time, don't entirely escape from this logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jindal, over to you. Well, I would say, um, you know, I, I, I had two quotes for each of my projects, and for the Frozen Neighborhood ones, it was a Greg Tate quote that I can't remember this speci specifically, but it meant something like, being black American is a sci-fi experiment, yeah. something mm -hmm. to that effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I'm operating from in pretty much in both scenarios mm -hmm. is that um, in sort of, I guess, contrast to uh, a lot of Western science fiction, which is almost just kind of cosplaying oppression, whether it's like the Maze Runner, Hands Made Tales, or what have you. These are things that are part of our actual reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Science fiction does, um, it takes issues, contemporary issues, it exacerbates them, um, and then it projects them into a kind of far-flung future mm -hmm. and imagines how these conditions <clears throat> might be resolved in those futures and what is sacrificed through resolving those particular things. And that is almost the basis of like the entirety of Western sci-fi, <laughs> right? <laughs> is, is, is kind of um, a sort of play acting, which, you know, black folks, folks in the global South have actually experienced. So much of what I'm thinking through when I'm doing my world building uh, and, and, and why it's still entrenched in, in these, you know, very specific realities is that it's, it's kind of like a living, continuous salvage punk, mm -hmm. right? We, whether it's music, culture, food, um, all manner, right, of, of how we both um, as, as kind of um, freed and enslaved folks throughout the diaspora or colonized and imperial uh, realities um, on, on the continent and elsewhere throughout the global south is a responding to this. So I'm, I'm, I'm still working within that framework. And in the tradition of science fiction, I'm exacerbating it and coming up with my own uh, very specific narratives around it to draw on things that we contend with and have contend with and continue to contend with. Um, and I feel, and it's interesting, I guess, that now in this reality with, you know, things like Roe vs. Wade being rolled back, right? The, the kind of other folks get to sort of, you know, get a sense of what <laughs> this has been like, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that terror has been brought home a little bit more, so it's more kind of present. But it's, I, I think it's just a way of, 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 I myself navigating through, I think this has been part of our, part of our lived experience, our historical experience, our trajectory in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm creating scenarios that really sort of articulate that and say that a lot of this is a, you know, a lot of this day to day is science fiction. You know, the fact that, that, that 
you know, black American and now with Afrobeats, you know, it's like almost a dominant global culture, right, of what we've made out of these particular circumstances. Um, so there's, there's that aspect. And there's also, um, again, you know, my, my father is Nigerian. I'm, I'm Yoruba is my sort of culture. Mm -hmm. And there's the, the sense of time is, is cyclical. Mm -hmm. It's not so binary in that this is the future and this is the past. Mm -hmm. They both kind of, you know, the past reverberates throughout the future in these cycles and these kind of echoes that travel forward and similarly with the feedback loop, they kind of travel back. And so the sort of, at least kind of Yoruba cosmological be belief, cyclical perception is that all of it is happening and has happened, right? And so um, in, in thinking through where I wanna place my sort of uh, imagined worlds, it is a sort of futurism, but it's in the play. You know what I mean? These, these trajectories, it's, it's not, that these are set points, you know, is that we kind of rotate and revolve through, through mm -hmm. these things. Um, just a very small way of, I guess, thinking about, um, yeah, like futurity and, and, and what it means, or at least trying to reconcile that there is always such a, a, a disconnect, right, in the way, um, in, in, in the West, we often think about all of these things. We think about um, the things we can draw on to affect uh, the mess that, you know, <laughs> colonialism and capitalism and white supremacy has made of the entire world. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind yeah. of my, my sort of response or my, my, my way of thinking through, thinking through that. Mm. Um, thanks, Felicity, for that um, the comment. There's there's so much there on what you said already, um, but it a, a lot resonates with some of those things that I were I was trying to think through in the book for sure. Specifically, um, this idea of uh, what you picked up on in terms of the not yet mm -hmm. and the complexity of that term, uh, which wants to do all sorts of things um, and raises a lot of contradictions and tensions mm -hmm. as as well. It's, it's one that I'm thinking about with, along with uh, a number of the artists that I'm working on, um, specifically Jonas Stahl, a, a Dutch artist that I, I didn't talk about this evening, but I, I write about later in the book, and Jana van Heswick, um, another mm -hmm. Dutch ar artist, were using this phrase um, in thinking about a future emancipation because they're aware of exactly that problem that you're pointing to, which is that um, uh, or, or the way they think about it, the way I, I think about it as well, um, is that you know, we can't ultimately um, know or determine what that emancipated future will be mm -hmm. given our positionality in a present that's deeply traumatized and um, mm -hmm. filled with histories and experiences of violence. So it's, it's what um, the Nigerian-American uh, philosopher Olufemi Taiwo calls mm -hmm. the identity problem. And he talks about this in relationship to exactly this, without using the word not yet, but um, speaking about how uh, you know, those of us who are in the present can't ultimately know what liberation or emancipation mm -hmm. would be in the future because uh, that will be experienced by subjects other than ourselves. And that would be a futurology which would fall into the trap of all of the different narratives of the late 1960s that were you know, doing precisely what you're trying to dismantle. So yeah. it would uh, <laughs> come across a different sort of epistemic. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that yeah. progressivist teleology mm -hmm. um, that you're pointing to is, is for sure the problem. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'm trying, uh, and I think along with a lot of the artists that I'm writing about, I'm, trying to, I'm struggling with this because uh, on the one hand, um, it's it's, I, it, it mm -hmm. seems like it's clear given histories of oppression what emancipation will include, will mm -hmm, it, what mm -hmm. it will not be. There's like a yeah. negative uh, aspect to this. Like in, mm -hmm. in, in Lex's work, in, in a way the 
photographs of current day Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, with all the stuff that we can read in those images in terms of austerity, neoliberalism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, privatization, security, compared to the, uh, the, the beautiful color and, and yeah. green images that, that he produced in, uh, an as an alternative to that. So there's a negative, a, a really striking negative moment as well as a, a positive one, but the danger with the positivity, with the positive mm -hmm. content is that we don't want to overdetermine the future mm -hmm. and produce a plan as if we mm -hmm. can know what that would be. So there's a necessary provisional mm -hmm. aspect to uh, futurism in all, in all the cases. Uh, like in the, the indigenous filmmaker uh, T.J. Cudham that I talked about, like that mm -hmm. video is, um, it's really, a, I, I, I've, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing work and, and partly, uh, one thing that I love about it is the lo-fi character of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, I think, very yeah. much on purpose and it gives a sense of that, um, that provisional uh, mm -hmm. rehearsal for a yeah. potential vision of the future. It's not determined, it's yeah. not precise, it's mm -hmm, not overproduced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that speaks volumes about uh, a resistance to mm -hmm. um, defining in advance what emancipation exactly will look like. Yeah. So it's a sort of, it, it resonates with a protopial, but it's not exactly the same. But yeah, it's harboring that same sort of sympathy. I mean, I, I maybe um, two other small questions, but what I wanted to jump here and jump in here um, and pick up on, on this question of how you uncouple something um, like an image of the future from a, from a plan or something like that. And, and the dean you know, alluded to the fact that what architects do is they, you know, we're in an architecture school, <laughs> they, um, uh, they make projects, they project for the, the discipline is an inherently a discipline of futurity and, um, and yet it's largely often one of scripting. And there's been any number of histories that, 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 that you know, try to uncouple or, or, or trouble or trouble that or, or that render architecture, let's say, out of sync with the present in the sense of the violence of capital. Or, I mean, so, so, you know, there's ways of, of thinking the ruptures of those temporalities or forms of, of disobedience and, and refusal. Um, but I, I, this is maybe a question for like, I, I, um, I was very struck not only by your history as, a, as an, as an architect and as a designer, yeah, or, or your, your description of yourself as, a, um, as having a design practice as an, and an art practice, or a designer and an artist, and um, in watching you present the, the, the Brooklyn Project, which is great, Brooklyn looks much better, you're right, it's like definitely a movement. Uh, I, I was wondering how you think those two practices together, and, and um, because there's a, a way in which the, the model of a, a, you know, a future, without a plan or a future without a telos or a future that, that harbors an imaginary that's a matter of a tree and a claim, a political claim and an affirmation to come back to the title, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it still harbors an ethic that you know, is not determinist or instrumentalizing and yet it seeks change. Yeah? And, I, and, I, and I wouldn't want, and I'm not trying to distinguish art from architecture. He, well, I am maybe, but I, I'm just trying to understand how how we think these disciplines together. And 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 this was, this is a reductive narrative of your presentation. But but um, you know, knowing th the film, having see watched the film, the film seems so firmly mm. an art practice. Yeah, the, mm. uh, the both of them, the fly through, the gestures. And I'm not saying architects don't produce animations on these, mm. but it, it seemed to to have to to operate with a set of institutional discursive coordinates that were in the art world and and the other parts of the presentation you know, seemed seemed to be engaging or you know seemed to be targeting architecture or something like that and i mm -hmm. m maybe i'm misreading that but i'm really curious to hear how we think that nexus of of art and architecture in your work and and maybe you know, if I, if I was to make a, a connection to TJ's work, how to think the the relationship of an artistic practice to a project or something like that? Yeah, like mm -hmm. how we how we think these without coupling them in a determinist way or in a in a in a um, utopian way in thinking about artistic practices as if they somehow escape capitalist you know formations and you know don't also channel a, a similar. Um, uh, field of yeah, technical, social, political, racial forces. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, is there a distinction to be made here, or 
I mean, you mm -hmm. use an and, you, you're a designer and artist. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just trying. No, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, that's funny. That is the, that is the, I guess, the most, um, I guess, longest running challenge of mm -hmm. my practice <laughs> of sitting here in venues like this and showing the work in something like the Venice Biennale or the MoMA and then showing it, uh, showing my kind of, you know, project at somewhere like the kitchen or more of a sort of white box space, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, there's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm operating within um, the kind of fundamental understanding of architecture by the broader audience mm -hmm. is that it presents so solutions mm -hmm. to um, problems or that it, um, that it that it should do that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know um and and it's, it's especially if you're deploying the conventions of of an architectural practice and its modes of visual representation mm -hmm. of drawing of model of site plan of photo montage of rendering mm -hmm. falls within the sort of marketability so i do draw on that in a sense in in in, in terms of the polish in terms of the finality of the images, right? You, you make the decision of where they fall um, on the scale of dystopian or dystopian or not, but they're clean. There's a tidiness to it, right? Um, and so for me, it's been very interesting to, um, you know, over time, kind of respond to the feedback that I've gotten, depending on where I'm showing this work. Um, part of why I, I do use the conventions um, of, of sort of visual arts representation, not only that it's, you know, part of my educational background, mm -hmm. um, but precisely because it, it does draw on that kind of aspect of like marketing and tidiness mm -hmm. and reaching an audience and this, for this kind of particular demographic and in a way to sort of upend that. There's projects I produce that are, um, they're not solutions, they're at, at best kind of improbable architecture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm or very bad architecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I always tell the anecdote when I presented my shanty mega structures mm -hmm. for Lagos, Nigeria, to Lego, you know, to students at Unilag mm -hmm. and Lagos School, you know, Lagos Architecture School. Um, one young woman got up, she was so mad, she was literally just shaking with anger mm -hmm. that I'm creating ruin porn for the consumption of Western uh, uh, media, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Reveling in this kind of um, aesthetic of uh, informal settlements, Makoko, using that language to create. To, and it's, 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 it's always for me incredibly fascinating um, because it, w it, was, it was imagined, it was, it was presented, I remember in CNN Africa, could this be the new skyline for Lagos, you know? Mm -hmm. And then so there was issue with that being um, reinforcing of stereotypes, right? But then another student said, well, why is this negative? This is, you know, inventive local materials. It's about community and what have you. Um, that's the aspect of, of again, the, the, the touchiness of how architecture, architecture, mm -hmm. capital A, build is considered, mm -hmm. right? You're supposed to, particularly when creating architecture that engages with the African continent, so much of it is NGO paternalistic based. You've mm -hmm, got to mm -hmm. do a school, you've got to do a, a, a health, you can't, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> so there, there hasn't, there, there isn't much to sort of draw on outside of that. Um, and so then navigating the art world is something very fascinating as well. A lot of the stuff that I do is digital, mm -hmm. but it's not digital in, um, a way that it looks clearly digital. So then it becomes difficult to market what, what is the value of this artwork, right? Um, and, and, you know, how do we make it saleable for collectors or, mm -hmm. or where does it fall within canon? You know, where, where do we place it, right? So there's these two kind of aspects that I find myself navigating as a black artist architect. Then there's the larger aspect of often in the artwork that um, the work must be contributing. So if the architecture is, if, if in the architecture world it's 
that this project must be solving a problem. Otherwise, it's reinforcing stereotypes or otherwise it's useless, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, in the art world, it's because you're a black artist, is it edgy? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. is, it, is, is it challenging things? Is it, 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 it can't simply be sort of abstraction for abstract sakes. I have to weave in these particular narratives. So it's very interesting um, for me to consider, you know, operating within both of these spaces and with all of the expectations that come with the work and what it looks like and how I articulate it. And I've been known to articulate it differently for one venue and switch <laughs> it up for another venue because in a way that's the art as well, yeah. the way I'm talking about it. You know what I mean? The mm -hmm. way I'm presenting it. And, uh, you know, also it's, it's something that's constantly evolving that I have to reconcile with, you know, legitimate criticisms mm -hmm. about the work. Mm -hmm. You know, is, it, is this, you know, not necessarily reinforcing, but is it drawing on certain things? Mm -hmm. What are the particular blind spots? Um, and I'll just wrap that up to say that ultimately I, I, you know, when, when speaking about an architecture, I'm trying to, you know, really consider the value of, of, of the fact that because the sort of general imaginary is that architecture is, you know, resolving issues when in reality it's very oftentimes reverse, like reinforcing the worst aspects of it yeah. um, at, at every level, at the mm -hmm. educational level, at the way, the kind of disconnect between professional practice and education, the exploitative nature of internships, of aggrandizing the individual and all the, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, why not consider, you know, more sort of fluid, um, amorphous parameters yeah, and the around probable, it. Probable, you know, to mm -hmm. come back to your term, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, it's doing so much important work, I think, and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, responds also where you end on the chapter, TJs, of saying that, you know, that basically neoliberalism turns the, the possible into the probable. You know, it scripts mm -hmm. that future through engineering a uh, particular disposition that, 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 you know, is precisely why the alternative futures that, you know, you recover would never take place. That's, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we know the game is fixed. And so, um, and so the, the improbable seems like a really good gesture to interrupt that instrumentalizing logic. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to answer my own question. Do I have time for one more question or we, shall we move? Um, <laughs> I mean, we... It's about outer space and space. It's I, I, I'm no, wondering. Okay, we should go to the audience. The, yeah. the, the <laughs> well, well, let's let's do one because no, I, no, I should think go. since <laughs> we have this large cohort, that my role is also sort of okay. channeling. Uh, I will talk over dinner about space. Uh, um, uh, yeah, or after. So, we are there any questions from the audience? I think the game is I'm taking I'm fielding questions from the audience, and yeah. you're you're the point person for the planetary cohort. Yes. Yeah. Um, or we'll mm -hmm. start with the planetary cohort. I can I can oh join I can I'll, yeah. jo I'll join a few <laughs> together because they, they sort of jump on, sure. on on many of the things that were already said before, um, which in a large part um, a, a many of the questions were about representation, uh, which I think is, is is important also given the context of the school to discuss here. So for example, um, Anna Halleck asks. Um, uh, do you find it visually possible, and I guess this is uh, uh, for Lek, um, um, do you find it visually possible to speculate about possible past while tracing back to the times before the Industrial Revolution and its further, further development of aesthetics? What if we would anchor futurisms before the Capitalo scene? Um, how this or utopian would it be to encounter visual essays and speculative pictures of a possible past like this without the machine looking development of technology as we know it now? And, and similarly, um, Laura Del Pino um, asks, how can we transform or adapt the space making techniques or the, the techniques of space making, I guess, so relevant in this school? Um, that tend to be classical and Western influenced uh, often into tools for inclusivity um, in a capitalist um, society. And I, I think that made me also think about um, uh, TJ's point in, in the book where he, um, which I don't think you talked about so much, but at one point in the book you talk about um, aesthetics as solidarity or solidarity as aesthetics um, in relation, for example, to, to I was also thinking the, the nation building aesthetics that, that were important um, in, in, in the second work you discussed. And related to that, just to, to 
jump in a, a, a couple more. Catherine O'Rourke um, is asking what the status of the nation state is um, in these works, in these possible futures. What role, if any, do governments or international collective bodies play in a healing future? Um, and similarly, both Ginger Nolan and Harshad Raisoni asks about uh, monuments, maybe to end there in relation to the, to the nation state as well, the role mm. of monuments. Um, uh, Ginger asked, um, I wondered if the two authors might want to share some reflections on the role of monuments in relations to histories and futurism. And I know that already came up a little bit in the presentations as well. Sorry, there's a lot, but I'm yeah. trying to, <laughs> to, to bring in a lot <laughs> from, from the cohort <laughs> to be fair since we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, Let's see, uh, the idea of aesthetics as solidarity, maybe I'll pick up on that because that becomes important and connects mm -hmm. to some of the things that Felicity was talking about before. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to think about this in terms of um, uh, how, um, um, as, um, how forms of experience uh, can be a place of ultimately struggle, um, not just uh, in relationship to um, um, forms of uh, emancipation, but also in relation to the present. So how can we, how can we rethink aesthetics as, as a site, not of um, what it is in some ways classically defined as a, a place of like purpose, purposelessness um, within mm. like a European, uh, philosophical tradition, but actually a site of um, of, of world building as a as um, something that can be performative in the act. That's something that I'm trying to get at in terms of this uh, phrase. Solidarity is also an important term that I bring up in the book. It's it's not something that you find often discussed or uh, or uh, practiced within the artistic context these days, especially as the art world is is just so. Um, instrumentalized and, and geared toward uh, uh, reaffirming and, and disciplining forms of competitive individualism. Mm -hmm. Like this is just so, uh, you know, determinative within artistic practice. So what does solidarity even mean within that context if we're trying to dedicate ourselves to not only criticizing the present but realize alternative um, tr alternative scenarios, whether they're retrofuturist or whether they're um, future possibilities. So um, uh, there's a, a, a large discussion in the book around um, s how solidarity might be engaged as a form of political relationality um, that is, I think, and I, I ultimately argue, really desperately needed if we're to commit to actually transforming conditions in the present. If we're truly faced, and I think we are, with um, conditions of uh, emergency, and I, I had a quick passage in my presentation about the need to connect different kinds of uh, formations of emergencies or think apocalypses together. Um, with that said, still within our present, we really face um, uh, an immense challenge in terms of what's happening today, in terms of just the socio-environmental catastrophe that is before us. So how can we turn um, aesthetics into a form of solidarity as a, as a site of, of struggle? That's not just, and, and this would be a place mm -hmm. to go back to your question mm -hmm. about connecting um, different spheres of, of activity, not just mm -hmm. art and architecture, but also um, social movements or mm -hmm. forms of, uh, of struggle. Like how can we not, how can we not just um, be placated by the aesthetic seductions within the framework of a, a gallery um, mm -hmm. situation, but actually work toward realizing and transforming material social conditions. So uh, again, I didn't present that, this aspect of the book tonight, but I, that's the second half that I really come around to, to saying, and it speaks to my own frustrations uh, as someone who writes about art, um, that often you end up with you know, uh, reaffirming the declarations of emancipatory ambitions. But what does it mean to mm -hmm. like, actually face the commodification of those visions within um, highly institutionalized artistic contexts? And mm -hmm. what does it mean to break out from those contexts mm -hmm. and actually um, work in a social context 
through social movement struggle mm -hmm. against these conditions of oppression. Um, so I look at different artistic slash activist practices mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the second mm -hmm. half of the mm -hmm. book. So from practices like, uh, like, uh, like Jonas Stahl's or Strike MoMA within mm -hmm. the context mm -hmm. of New York, decolonize this place also in, in New York, and there's lots elsewhere. Um, but what, you know, what does it mean to, as, as decolonize this place argues, what does it mean to strike art? Not in order to um, attack or negate artistic creativity, but actually to liberate it from the conditions of its <coughs> capitalist commercialized institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Like this is stuff that I'm trying to get at. So aesthetics as a form of solidarity, um, I find is, um, is practiced in all sorts of ways, mm -hmm. uh, but not often discussed within um, especially <coughs> academic or even mm -hmm. your, uh, museum or curatorial discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's, it's, too, it's too threatening, it's, it's too like actual like in the world political mm -hmm. uh, challenge and, and, and actual struggle. Uh, but I think it's, uh, that's really crucial and it, it would be um, ultimately, I found halfway through the book, um, I was myself frustrated with some of the claims <laughs> that I was making about um, the utopian possibilities of emancipation mm -hmm. and the need to come around and ask difficult questions like what's keeping us from this and what do we need to do to overcome these, these systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. I'm scanning. Do we have any questions from the There's a question up here. Yeah, there. Yeah. There's two so questions right there. Yeah. Thank you for the discussion and the wonderful presentations. Um, I had one question, maybe a follow up on the aesthetics comment. Uh, it looks like the site of resistance uh, for f the critique of future is very much the visual domain, the ocular, the scopic domain in both of your practices. Mm -hmm. uh, even though you uh, alluded on the, the role of aesthetics uh, that is a bit beyond the the visual uh, paradigms. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about the cultural logic of late capitalism, which relies a lot on this image-making uh, paradigms, and is there a risk or a danger on reproducing or resisting critiquing capitalism with its own currency? You know, is, there a, is, there, is there a future critique that can lie outside of the visual, uh, which you know, have may, may, may uh, produce a different kind of critique? Yeah, I think, um, and I think it goes back to your question of, you know, how do we um, demonstrate solidarity in the real practical sense, real practical sense when we're navigating these systems and these institutions, which, as we know, um, I guess simultaneously like grant you a platform, but also undermine the radical. The, like the radicality of what you're trying to achieve. And it connects to what you're saying about that visual, right? Um, that, that it is like, that the visual is so incredibly seductive that it can be marketed, that it can be co-opted, that it then can be repackaged and it can serve as its own sort of, um, you know, self-destructive <laughs> agency, which I think, which is why um, the TJ cut hand, right? Which, which is such an important um, thing that you said about the lo-fi quality mm -hmm. of it, right? It defies that, it, 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 it defies a kind of finish and a polish, which is incredibly attractive to mm -hmm. the, um, incredibly attractive to the system, you know, to the institution. Um, and also resists that finality, resists saying that we have resolved this here. And it allows it to be a, um, a like self-replicating, evolving kind of thing. And I think therein potentially lies the idea of where solidarity can, can, can find itself in that kind of hand over fist informal exchange that's cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary where we're not gatekeeping um, the sort of opportunities we have in a way to fundamentally mm -hmm. circumnavigate that gatekeeping is to have it not be as readily appealing to those who can say, oh, I can take this. And then and, and it comes back then to the visual is so seductive, 
even when it's not right even when there's an ugliness to it like i said like i was you know challenged for a sort of ruined porn right for yeah. a particular kind of look um i i think about that at all i think about you know soundscapes the haptic the touch the feel you know where else can we explore um you know these spaces where we're trying to resist and i don't have the answer to it because i operate so much in that kind of visual feel. I've worked a little bit in sound with uh, <laughs> my collaboration with Umpo, you know what I mean? Like, say, you know, like that, the, like the ability to really draw on that. But I think that's so incredibly and deeply underexplored precisely because it's not seductive to the institutions. And there is our personal ambition and trajectory tied up in a lot of what we're doing. That's the reality of it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so this is what we have to contend with, you know? Um, but no, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if we finish with, with your question and yes. oh. your question <laughs> uh, to the next one, in a way, like maybe you even responded. Oh, but man. If you had a question, you that, that just put so much pressure on my question oh, now. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just... Um, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to draw out the references to uh, to spaceships and, and like you know you brought up Star Wars and it's you know <laughs> channeling of um, colonial and capitalist histories and and obviously the All Africa postport and um, uh, and the, the iteration is 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 based in Western Zambia which is presumably a reference to the Afronauts as well and and uh, you know the whole history of um, of, uh, I, I, I mean, I've got notes about Sunra and Af other Afrofuturisms, and, um, but it, it, it struck me also that the Super Futures Haunt Collective also dreamt of building a spaceship, and, uh, and you also mentioned the Black, Black Space Agency at the BQF, and, and, and what I sort of wanted to draw out here, um, actually two things. I, I wanted to ask like a question about, um, this beautiful gesture not of going to outer space, um, but to using outer space tech, to using the possibility of launching rockets to create a, a, a connection across a diaspora community, which is like almost like the total opposite of what the, mm -hmm. the, the most science fiction sort of um, um, space rocket projects do and but I also wanted to put it into the connection of something that I'm obsessed with right now which is all these uh, projects from right after 1972 from the early to mid 1970s of um, earth free ports and spaceports and like the Otrag uh, initiative in what was then Zaire the Democratic Republic of the Congo that that under the rubric of offering um, offering uh, you know satellite connectivity to to African countries and possibly other third world countries was was a you know private capitalist initiative that was you know mm -hmm. simultaneously <laughs> trying to battle the U.S. and the Ariane rocket that the French were mm -hmm. launching and the Soviet space program and and so the ways in which the the sort of African futurity that that is um, uh, you know Mobutu of course had all sorts of reasons for for allowing a German corporation, a West German corporation, to lease 100,000 square kilometers, like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> size of half of West Germany, um, uh, to, to launch missiles. But, the, mm -hmm. but, but there's like, it's just a, such a symptomatic moment of that, you know, tense sort of optimism and an incredible inscription within, like, uh, a sort of, you know, rise of neo-colonial logics and the immediate wake of, yeah, of independence across Africa. And so I just sort of couldn't, like, help asking, like, how to, th how to think all the, the, the continuity of the liberatory, you know, possibility of, of outer space, you know, in the work of Sunra and others with, with actual history, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, that is playing out at this moment. And it's like, so, I mean, I know it's a, classic trope of effort futurism, but it's also, it's such a complicated one, yeah? It's mm -hmm. like, and, and your work, I, again, the, the refunctioning, you know, of the outer space travel from going to Mars to, to um, yeah, going to the Caribbean or something, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, really, really interesting as a, so, sorry, uh, it's, maybe it's not a question, is it? But 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh. <laughs>